there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Oh well, I guess we we should negative go to John. To the Catholic cause Mary. What's that? Kind of negative to the Catholic cause of Mary. Maybe a Democrat brought it. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be. All right. Let's see. All right. So we we had the uh, we had the regal. We had the the nobleman, the noble person that came from Capernaum and obviously was looking for Jesus in Canaan. And basically, Jesus makes a really interesting statement. And what I did is I gave you another, um, what do you call it, synopsis of four. So let's finish four, and then we go over the synopsis. And what's really interesting is when you look at these things in a synopsis, you get rid of all the extraneous material, and then you can really see clearly. And it's not really extraneous material. It's just we don't tend to look at stuff the way we should look at stuff. Because we look at it and, oh, these are stories, right? These are just accounts or scenes, just like we're used to reading in literature. No, they're not. They're, they're a logos to tell us, and they connect. So if we see it in a, synop in a synopsis form, we many times can get a, a much broader understanding of exactly what's going on. So that's what I, I provided. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. I, I usually do this as the end of each thing as a telos. So let's see if we can find the telos as you say. So in the NIV it says, while Jesus, while he was still on the way, uh, the priest was, Jesus makes a logical argument to him, you go on your way, your offspring lives. The man was persuaded to the logical argument which Jesus said to him, and he went on his way. While he was still on his way, his servants met him, actually say, with the news that the boy was living. Okay. There's the Greek, here's King James, and as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. Uh, by the way, going down is interesting. You know, you go down to town, where are you going in England? If you go down to London. town. London. You always go up from town and down to town in England, and it's always London, which is very interesting because in the King James, we get going down to Capernaum, which is very interesting because it's north, but that's okay. Um, so in the literal translation, even now, but of him, kata ben notos, he is coming down, descending the slaves of him, the douloi, the slaves, douloi, <laughs> multiple, du, du, doulos and is a slave, douloi, slaves. So they're not just servants, they're slaves. Hype intensin, they went opposite under fell in with him from the other direction. Uh, you know, the Greek is really cool because we don't have a word like this, but they got this awesome word. They went opposite under. They literally <clears throat> fell in from the other direction. So they're coming down the road, which probably there's only one, right? And he's walking down the road, and the slaves are coming, and they fell in with him from the opposite direction. What a cool word. Um, because of military? <clears throat> what's that? Be a military word, maybe? Because it's always describing troop movements. The Greeks are that way. You know, the Greeks have that thing going. Because remember, every guy, every free man in Greece is what? A soldier. Yeah, until they're 30. Right? Because you have to be part of the Hoplites to protect Greece. Now, that is in their language like crazy. And so are the Romans. All that Ro Roman language is full of military terminology. That we, we just, you know, even, well, if we knew Latin and Greek, guess what? We'd all perceive it. But because we don't, we read it in the translation, and the translation doesn't have that cool stuff. But you're right. There's military words that we use that are out there that the military uses all the time to describe how to attack an enemy that most people don't understand the word phrasing of. Well, even, even like marching, right? Like, like, I used to do uh, marching. Um, when I was in, in ROTC, you know, I was the march guy. I was the guy who did the marching, and you have all these fancy march steps you do and things. So you take a column of people, and you, you order them in marching, and you could do all kinds of cool parade things. They're really neat. And, and you know, yeah, I can see this hype intention to be a military marching term or a hope-like term. In other words, 
I take two two groups of hope lights and I say hypertension. So they they match up and they're going the same direction now. But yeah, you're right. There, there's all kinds of of interesting possibilities in the Greek, and we don't even know the full extent. To him, Legantes making a logical argument. So did they just tell him? No. How they said he got up and ate something. And... Yeah, yeah. You know, your son that you left was dying, but your son was suddenly, his eyes came open, he was talking to us, you know, yeah, you know, he was he was eating, yeah, which is a big deal because you make sure that I ghost, right? That's in their culture. Um, that or because the child, the face of him, he lives. He's dead. He lives, which is really interesting. But even now he is coming down, descending. His slaves went opposite under, fell in with him from the other direction, him, making a logical argument, that his child lives. Yes, sir. I'm still kind of hung up on their, their turn descending. He's going north, so we would in our in our language we would say you're going down to you're going south, or you're changing in elevation from a high place to a low place. I'm not sure why they why they made a point of saying he's going down. Well, in in prior to Victorian England, if you're going to any big town, you were going down to town. But in Victorian England, that changed that you only said you were going down to town when you were going to London, which is really cool because if you know the code words, which aren't really code words, they're common cultural knowledge, right, in that culture. But we don't get it. I mean, unless you... We, we shorted downtown. We're going downtown. Downtown. Yeah. With, you know, downtown. downtown. Yeah. It's, you know, we shortened it. Yeah, except if you're going downtown, you mean any large town. That's yeah. the common usage in the King James era. But in England, even today, if some person tells you, I'm going down to town, then you are to know they are going to London town. They're not going to Monmouth. They're not going to Carlisle. They're not going to Brisbane. They're not going to Nottingham. They are going to London town. To <laughs> Clark, <laughs> Remember the, the geography? So were they going from North. Canaan South? Were they going oh, from a high down. place to a low place? That's to me would make sense then about descending. So well, was, I didn't know if South was higher elevation than than North. It, it's really not uh, in that sense in the Greek, but. I didn't. I don't have a train map. If we got a train map, I'm sorry to get a train map. If I showed a train map, basically that area is kind of hilly, but relatively flat. So relatively flat, but hilly because it's a uh, an area where it's a plain of Eschedrian. The plain of Eschedrian is where, you know, I told you that's where everybody invades when they want to come through. That's why, by the way, uh, what, what do you, what do you think they gave Herod that area? It's the most harvest, it has the greatest harvest, it has the most water, it has the Sea of Galilee. Why would you give that to Herod? First line of defense. It's the least defensible area in the whole place. So, hey, yeah, Herod, you can have all the harvest, you can have all the fish, but guess what? It's the plain of Eschedrian. That's where everybody is attacked when they attack, you know, Israel. Go right through the plain of Eschedrian. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Romans are, you know, look, the Romans are really smart. So are the Greeks. Uh, you notice they got the Decapolis. Where's the Decapolis? It's to the other side of the river, right? Rivers are great natural defenses. Jerusalem is on a hill in the hills, in the mountains. So base of mountains they have there. So it's a pretty safe area, but not the plain of Eschedrian. Anyway, um, when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left. And this is really fun in the Greek. They inquired he of the hour when they began to amend, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left. He inquired or discerned through inquiry. That's cool, right? We haven't seen this word before. This is a really cool word. Epitheto. He acquired or certain through inquiry. 
certainly accordingly, the time or period from of them when he better dressed to be better. Comp sotero, which is interesting. Better dressed means to be better. Uh, obviously, you're probably naked in your you know bed if you're ill, and then you're able to put on your clothes because okay. Well, yeah. The thing that's interesting about this, though, is remember, we never, we forget how many pieces of clothing did the average person own? Like one, right? And a rich person might have a couple. How many, how many nightgowns do you think you had? The rich guy, remember the, remember Mark, we think it's Mark, and they, he, he lost his coat or he lost his thing, and it says that he was basically right. naked, but he may have lost his underwear, but nobody had underwear. It was his undergarment. It was a light undergarment, which, you know, rarely did, did the poor ever have anything like that. They, they didn't have any kind of undergarments. But this guy was probably a rich guy. I remember a noble. And here is, let's see, of him, that because yesterday Horan, Heavy Dolman, seventh, sent forth him the... Pyr etos, the curse of Zeus. Pyr etos, the curse of Zeus. You have a fever, it's not just a fever. There's no word in Greek for just a fever. It's pyr etos, it's the curse of Zeus, literally. Accordingly, he acquired from them at the time which he held to be better. Accordingly, they said to him that yesterday, at the seventh hour, sent forth from him the curse of Zeus. Woohoo! That's really different than he got better from a. He liveth or got better, right? The curse of Zeus was lifted. Hmm. I probably should have kept that in the uh, synopsis. You can write it yourself. <laughs> then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. That's what it says in NIV. There's a Greek. So the father knew it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. He knew, and know, which is interesting because we usually get the word uh, etios, right? So it, etios means to stare at, and that's usually translated to know. But this is egno, which is from gnosis, which literally means to know. So, you know, our English translation takes um, a cultural, it's not really an idiom. You know, to stare at means you literally see it for yourself. And ignos or gnos means that you know it in your mind, which is really different in my opinion. Certainly, accordingly, the father that, or because, in it kind of in that one thing to the a timer period, in he, Ethan, he said to him, he said, literally, he said to him, that Jesus, Jesus said to him, offspring of you, he lives. And he was persuaded, if he stood, he was persuaded, convinced by a logical argument, himself. And the oikia, the a dwelling, the family, the household of him, all or the whole. Okay? So, Accordingly, the father knew that in that one thing, in the time which Jesus said to him, your offspring lives, and he was himself <clears throat> persuaded, and his whole dwelling. Very interesting. And then he used pa, P-A-S, pas, he used pole, <laughs> which is an interesting uh, word in itself. Because that's <clears throat> different. It's a different kind of word than we're used to seeing in Greek. Previously, <clears throat> he had said, <clears throat> basically, Blessed, but for those who have seen and believe, what about those who have not seen and believe? He made that point. Is that the same wording for see? Um, okay. It, it depends on the translator. And we have to look to see what it says in the Greek. Because if it's idios, E-I-D-O-S, idios, that means to stare at, to to see it with your physical eyes. On the other hand, agnosis or gnosis means to know with your mind, which to me are two completely different things. Because you can stare at something and not know what you're looking at, or even have it in your brain, right? Where 
when you know it, it, it implies that you fully comprehend it. And I'm, I'm kind of saddened. This is, what, this is why when I translate this stuff for you, I use always the same words. You see what I'm saying? I don't make up words that sound good in the context or seem to fit the context or seem to look right. I always use the exact Greek words so that you get a cultural understanding of what is really being said here. Yes, sir. I was just thinking, in terms of this account, is this the first account of Jesus doing something remote? That when he physically wasn't at the place where it happened, it, he changed something from a distance. Actually, actually, remember the water and the wine? Did Jesus touch the wine? Did he touch any of the implements? It was there. Well, he was physically present, but did he even see what was going on? No. He told the servants, right? The slaves, actually. The doula. Well, guess what? This is really interesting. Now, you're right. You know, there, there is a huge proof text within, okay, we're, we're way past it. You know, I, I think we really missed the spiritual point of this because there is spiritual and supernatural stuff going on here, but we just don't like, we've just got our scientific brains on, right? To the ancient world, this is a big deal. Did he have power over the local, right? And then he had power over the, at least as far as Capernaum, which is amazing, right? That's a long ways. That's, what, 10 miles away. And to the ancient world, this is a huge question because how powerful are you? If you're a god, and remember, their gods are local, right? Their, their city, their area, whatever. The Greek gods, do the Greek gods have power in Levant? Well, there was a curse of Zeus, right? It's a Greek understanding. So Jesus basically took Zeus and smacked him. Did a Zeus smackdown right there. So there's huge things in this, you know, before even Jesus didn't touch anything. You know, in, in some of the Gospels, right, in the Gospel accounts, the history of the Gospels, he basically makes a paste of, of spit and puts it on the guy's eyes, right? And that's physically touching. Uh, in some cases, he touches people. In other cases, he doesn't touch them at all, right? Or they touch, they touch, or they touch him. him. Yeah. But I think it's really, it is, it is very important. And that's getting our ancient worldview, right? And also getting back our spiritual sense. That's why I write my books the way I do about uh, supernatural stuff. Because I think it's important for people to get back a spiritual sense of the world. Because we look, look at the world from a, so, supposedly a scientific aspect, right? And yeah, crystals aren't going to help you. You know, chemicals aren't going to help you. They don't really help the body. You can do all you want with them, but they're not really helpful. But is there spiritual and, and supernatural? Well, well, yeah. We attest that there is God. And remember, I draw you the picture. What's more true, the spiritual or the physical? Jesus would say it's the spiritual, right? And by the way, that's eternal, where the, the physical is not eternal. Oh, anyway, I, I think it's important because we, we, try to, we tend to get out of the spiritual sense and, you know, uh, or make fun of it, which is really sad. But anyway. Don't you think the news of this miracle traveled far and wide? Maybe, maybe not. I'd like to think it did. Uh, we're going to see some reflection on that. But remember that Regal... He, has, he doesn't have any reason to hide it now, but he was hiding his son who was sick, right? Had a fever, a curse of Zeus in his own household. That's a badness, especially since he's a regal, right? And they're Hellenized. So his son should have been in a Schlepion, dying. And there's no Christians yet that are going to take care of him in a Schlepion. So, yeah. Maybe, I hope, I, I, you know, we don't get that impression, but we do get the, what do you call it? Um, because of what happened with the Samaritan woman, you get the, the Samaritan woman is the greatest hero so far in John, but probably the greatest hero so far in all the Gospels. But she did, she witnessed, right? 
to the people in spite of the pain and suffering it would cause her. Will the regal do the same? That's one down the house. Kind of hard to control. Yeah. The slaves. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, that's putting it on a good ancient mindset. It's not just the slaves, but yeah, you're right on because the slaves and the servants are going to be, yeah, right? You know, they're going to tell everybody. But what's really impressive is it wasn't just him, right? He, he was a witness to his household. Now, it doesn't give us, was he a further witness? It would be really cool, right? We want to know the rest of the story. But it does say this. This is the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. To Galilee. In the King James, it says, this is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. And here's what it says in the Greek. Uh, but anew, you know, uh, also anew is, is really a cool uh, Second, supernatural or ceremonial occasion, Simeon, Simeon, Hipposin, he made her dead, Jesus, having come or gone from out or among of the Eugeans of Judea into the Galilee, uh, to Galilee, the Galileo. But I knew it was the second supernatural or ceremonial occasion Jesus did, having come out from, come out from out of Judea into the Galilee, into the Galileo. Um, uh, second Simeon Jesus came out of Judah to make the Simeon in the Galil he also came out of Judea to make a great miracle of the reaping in Samaria so where did Jesus okay uh, we'll get to it because we'll go through the um, synopsis or the the outline for this, but the big deal here is, remember Jesus said that a foreteller, a prophet, is not appreciated in his own homeland, and I told you that's a beautiful irony, because we know, well, all the hearers of this have already heard Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or at least heard about it, right, and they know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And where is he doing these miracles, these Simeon, these signs? In the Galil. Yeah. Yeah. This is a wonderful irony. And, um, well, there's even more. Let's look at the, I gave you a synopsis. I think I've got a better one here. I've been trying to be more uh, proficient about what I've done. I've got the whole of the thing here, the whole of four in translation here, so I can use it. Okay. Well, it looks to me, though, that in Nazareth itself, the people didn't accept him. They're like, oh, this is just Jesus who grew up here, and we know his family, and like it said, he couldn't do any miracles there because of their lack of faith. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I don't think we get that in John. Um, the thing is that you got a couple things working here, and what we need to do is we need to go back and look at what the Greek actually says, because what happens, what happens to our great theologians and our great translators is what do they try to do? Uh, bolster their theology. And match what they think Jesus said. So when Jesus is in Cana and he makes the claim that a foreteller a prophet is not, not welcome or not believed in his own fatherland, what do they take that to mean? Yeah, he's, well, he's rejected by the Judeans, by the Jews, all the Jews, right? He's rejected by all the, the people, which is not true at all. As a matter of fact, he's doing miracles, Simeon, in the Galil. And Matt, he did Simeon in Jerusalem. It said he did. He just didn't. It didn't. The big deal to John was not the Simeon he did in Jerusalem. That's kind of expected, right? But the Simeon he did outside of Jerusalem and in Samaria, right? The, the great miracle of the reaping that's not called a Simeon, but it obviously is. Yeah? So we, we have this. 
Um, they like to call them synoptic gospels. They're not synoptic. They are logos to tell us that are each separate, different logos to tell us. If I call them a synoptic gospel, though, I can claim there is Q somewhere, and I'm still looking for Q. I have a I have a copy of supposed Q in a book that they they claim is the Q, and I'm like, dude, until you find me the Q, I don't believe you. There is no such thing as Q. No ancient document. No ancient writer from the period talks about this magical cue, but show me your cue, right? Show it to me and I'll believe. I, I just, you know, it just cracks me up, but they make up stuff. So the, they're synoptic. So what do I gotta do in my translation? I gotta make them synoptic. I gotta make them fit. As a matter of fact, what's really interesting, and in you may not remember, but when we looked at Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark uses really different words in the Greek. For the same incidents. If they're so synoptic, why would the writer use different words? Basic Greek words. Hmm. I don't think that makes it synoptic. Nor do I think that makes it a Q-based document. Just saying. So, chapter 4. The very first thing about chapter 4 is Jesus and basically his disciples make more disciples and immerse more than John. That's the first part of chapter 4. That should make you aware. Okay, now, I do not, chapters are added. They're added in, right? But the continuous logos to tell us would tell you that what is the rest of 4 or the rest of the gospel going to be about? The answer is Jesus and his disciples make more disciples and immerse more than John. In other words, they're much more successful than John. And whatever we talked about John, take Jesus and add steroids. As a matter of fact, um, what was the message of John? The kingdom of here, heaven is here. Yeah, we love to translate it it's near. Why don't, why don't we like to say it's near? Well, theologically, we like to call it, we like to say it's near, because if it's not here, then we don't have to do anything about it, right? If it's if it's here, what do you got to do? Something, right? You got to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. If it's near, it's like, you know, it's, what's that? I've got time. Uh, yeah, I got, remember, remember, what did he tell the Samaritans? Matt, we'll get to this, but this is a beautiful point. The Samaritans, right? He told the disciples. The fields are white for the harvest, but we need harvesters, and they still didn't get it. And he said, "The reaper, who's the, or the sower? The sower is the Samaritan woman, and she's doing her job. And guess what? The disciples are sitting there uh, eating lunch break. They're they're you know they're yeah. taking they're eating McDonald's hamburgers, right? Uh, we're we're gonna let us finish our fries. Hey, you want some fries, Jesus?" Right? And the spirit of woman is out running through the town. Anyway, um, so this is going to be about how Jesus and his disciples, Jesus is immersing and making more disciples than John. So that is the point of this from now on. Before that, we had the whole thing in Nicodemus. We had the different, I don't, I don't have it all written down. But if you can remember, remember I maybe I should have make a mini synopsis from the very beginning. But, you know, we have Jesus is God. We have that whole thing about John the Baptist. We have the whole thing about Nicodemus. We have, let's see, who else? Oh, the, the water into wine, the first Simeon, you know. We have all these incidences happening and all these things that are logos to tell us to prove the spirituality that the Spirit of God is in every person, right? And that the Spirit of God is what it's all about. And that's what he tells Nicodemus. Nicodemus don't get it. But guess who gets it? We'll see. So he's going from Judea to Galilee. So he's coming back up from Jerusalem and the Passover through Samaria. So we get this first part about Jesus, you know, making more disciples, immersing more than John. And where is he obviously doing that? He's obviously doing it basically down in Jerusalem and on his way back up, because that's what we get is that area that's really in the south part of the Galil. And then 
he goes through, or, or the south part of Samaria, then he goes to Samaria, and this is, I'm trying to wrap this up as close as I can get. I tried to cut your stuff as much as possible, but the biggest point. The Samaritan woman says, and we have a Samaritan woman who's a married woman, Judeans do not use jointly with Samaritans. What she means, okay, when she says use jointly, Jesus says, give me some water, and her answer is, they don't, we don't use jointly. What does she mean? She means that they do not worship or sacrifice. You guys understand the ancient world. You've got to understand the ancient world. If, um, what did Paul say? Is it okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols? Yep. Only yeah, if. You don't participate in your life with someone that you talk about. Well, it only, if it doesn't lead your brother to sin. If it doesn't cause your brother to sin. Now, the Jerusalem Council said, should you eat meat sacrificed to idols? No. Paul's message is really different than the, the Council of Jerusalem. I just read what that thing is like, you have to, you as the stronger person, have to, you know, honor the person that's weaker than you. Even though in your mind, there's nothing wrong. Well, it's all clean. It's okay, you know, if somebody is going to... Be the bigger person. Yeah, be the bigger person. Christianity changed the world because in the Greek worldview okay if you are not a participating if you are not participating in the sacrifice and worship of that city-state you cannot share now the Jews were were uh, what not cosmopolitan they were um, they were uh, I guess cosmopolitan is a good word. They were cosmopolitan enough to know that you're going to have problems with travelers, uh, merchants, people coming through. So they kind of had a, an open attitude, right, about it. But to the Samaritans, what about the Jews? What about the Judeans, the guys in Jerusalem? No. In my book, Centurion, I write about it. They're going, you know, the only reason they let those, the, those rascally Romans into their inns is because Abinadar was half Jew. And so because he was half Jew and spoke the language of Judea, the Jewish language, the Aramaic, then the inns would let him go in and he could bring his legionnaire buddies, probably not a whole lot, but you could participate. Um, this gets really deep. Matter of fact, there was a huge, there was a huge problem. The Romans had a huge problem, I guess, they, you know, I mean, culturally, right? Um, buying slaves, buying provisions. And if you read my novel, they actually sold the provisions. They sold stuff in the Legion compound. And the people selling it to them were Jews and Jewish merchants who were buying this products and then bringing them into the Jewish area. because. You know, we don't like to think about it, and we say, oh, you shouldn't be mean that way. But that was life for the whole world in the ancient world. So if you did not jointly participate in worship and sacrifice, you did not sit down with a person. As a matter of fact, remember when God, God, told Peter to go talk to Cornelius, what did, what did, what did Peter do? If God taught you, go ahead. He did, but other people were like, why are you doing this? Well, no, Peter said it first. <laughs> God, I, 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 I'm not going to break the law. I would never sit down with a person that's, you know, not, not a Jew, that, that's not circumcised. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, God slapped him, slapped him, and said, look, he even gave him like a double message. God slapped him saying, dude. You know, I told you. You know, if God told you, you probably should listen. Just say it. But old Peter had issues. And, he, and by the way, was he following the law? No, not at all. That's what the Torah says at all. So, you know, this is huge. But the big deal for the Samaritan woman was not, it, we think it was um, just taking a drink, right? It's not. It's culturally deep in this culture. 
They do not because of worship and sacrifice. Period. Done. So, the next thing that Jesus says is the sacrificial gift of God. He claims to be the sacrificial gift of God. He says, I'm a Doran. Period. You see what he just said? He said, I am. I am the sacrifice. That's what he tells her. And I'll give you living water. Water I will give you will not ever, you'll not cause you thirst <coughs> into the age. And the, he means the messianic age, which is here. Remember, John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is here. And matter of fact, in Matthew and Mark, what's Jesus' message? The kingdom of heaven is here. So Jesus says, I'm a sacrificial gift of God. I give you living water. The water I will give you will prevent your thirst into the messianic age and will cause a fount springing up into life perpetual, everlasting life, you like to say. And the lady says, give me this water. <coughs> give me this water. She gets it. Because Jesus asked her for water, and she said, we don't jointly use. Because basically worship and sacrifice, Jesus says he's a sacrifice, and what did she just do? What happened to her mind? What happened to her way of thinking? She did a complete 180. In other words, before she was telling him, because you, you believe in sacrifice differently from me, I cannot share with you. Or, or you shouldn't be asking me, right? Matter of fact, what would most Jewish men do? They would just take it, right? Because that's the way the world is. Because if you're a, if you're a married woman at a well, and you got a thing, give me it. You know, I'll, I'll do it. Don't touch me, right? You're a dirty Samaritan. But instead, she says, give me this water. And by the way, all this happened before he says, she says, I hold not a man. Which is really interesting. Now, we might say, you know, I'm, I'm not into this. I think you have to repent big time. But there was no repentance going on. This was an, uh, what do you call it? A, um, she was convinced that he was not only the sacrificial gift, but that he could provide her living water. And also, Jesus offered it to her before she repented, which is really interesting. But she says, I hold on a man. And he says to you, you have held five men. And now whom you hold is not your man. That makes her reply, <clears throat> you're a foretelling. This, this is really, like I said, this is probably the smartest person in the whole gospel. Time is coming, and the whole deal is, okay, she said you're a foreteller, so guess what he does? He makes a prophecy. a prophecy. Yes, here's the prophecy. This is beautiful. Time is coming when not in this hill nor in Jerusalem. You stare not at whom you worship. We worship because the rescue of the salvation is from out of the Judeans. Out of Judea, literally. So, do you see? This is a beautiful logos to tell us, following in ancient lines, stuff that we would probably not pick up on unless we, we kind of get a, you know, culture recognition of what's going on. He goes on. Time is coming. That's a foretelling. Time now, time now for worship of God in conscious breath, yourself. So basically, right now is the time for you to worship God in conscious breath, yourself, which means you don't need a what? A temple. Well, you don't need a temple, you don't need a priest, you don't need any intermediary. What you need is the sacrifice, who is Jesus. And by the way, what happens? She says, a Messiah in Hebrew is coming as Christ. The anointed one in Hebrew is coming as anointed in Greek to tell us about everything. And Jesus says, <coughs> Ego emi. Ego emi. Total, total completion. If you want, the telos of this whole thing with Samaria is ego emi. 
but there's much more to this. There is more to this. So this is a beautiful logos to telos that goes about worship and sacrifice, sacrificial gift, the font, etc. She says she changes. Give me the water. Okay? And she he calls, he she confesses, she confesses. You want to say she confesses sin, that's cool. She confesses. I hold not a man. That is a huge confession because guess what she looks like? She's she she's married, she's probably has her hair covered, which means she is she's saying that she's a married woman, but she's not. And that's huge, right? So in her culture, this is a badness. But she confesses, I hold on a man. And Jesus says, Yeah. He says, I know. You've held five men, and now whom you hold is not your man. And she knows right then, you are a prophet. So he prophesies. And what's really cool is he prophesies, and we get not just a prophecy. We get a direct relation that goes back to who? Nicodemus, right? Because you, what did he tell Nicodemus? Oh, yeah, we have to worship in the born of water and the spirit meaning we worship in the spirit. Bingo. And so guess what? The water remember I tell you the water is not necessarily the water of baptism. <clears throat> the water is water living water, right? And then at the end the segue is to time now for worship of God in conscious breath yourself. And it's specific, yourself. And he says, the Messiah, she says, the Messiah is coming, Christ is coming, I am. Okay, this is a beautiful, in my opinion, this is one of those beautiful uh, statements of powerful statements. And it goes, there's more to it, though. The disciples come back, forget about the disciples, because the disciples are just, uh, they're gags, okay? They are gag elements. All this thing about the food and whatever, the important thing about the food, we'll get to that. But the big deal is this. The people ask, is this the Christ? Why did they ask that question? Who told them? The Samaritan woman puts down her stuff. She goes out. The disciples pass her coming. The disciples got their McDonald's, right? They're ready. Hey, Jesus, who gets McDonald's for you? And... The people are coming to ask this question. Is this the Christ? The people came to Jesus, and Jesus tells the disciples, my food, my food, raise up your eyes and look closely at the empty expanses that are even now brilliant white forward to a reaping. I mean, I'm condensing a whole lot of this, but he basically tells them that his food is to reap the harvest. That doesn't sound like food, does it? And to do the will of the Father. And so he says, raise up your eyes, look closely at the empty expanse, they're even now brilliant. What's brilliant? Who's coming? The people are coming from Samaria, right? And he says, the reapers paid and the sower also. The sower is the lady. He's trying to get the disciples to do something, right? And they're not doing nothing. They don't even get it. They're like, well, I don't know what's going on, right? So... The Samaritans are persuaded of the married woman through her witnessing. All right, now go back. What's the very beginning of this whole thing? It says, Jesus and his disciples are making more disciples, makes and immerses more than John. What did this, what did this account just show us? It just went into a whole new place. Yeah. That wasn't even open. And, and guess what, you know? We don't know if in the end he, does, if they, you know, we don't know if he baptized Samaritans. It wouldn't really cool if they told us. The implication is that he did. The disciples did baptize Samaritans because he told them, I will give you what kind of water? Living water. Which, by the way, living water is kind of a, it, it's they don't call the mikvah living water, but the mikvah is what kind of water? From a natural source 
flows. Yeah, it has to be from a natural force, uh, source that flows or from rainwater. There are specifics. Or it can be the Jordan River. It can be certain rivers are allowed by the rabbis because they're flowing, even though the Jordan River is really a dirty river. But, you know, <laughs> they allow certain sources to be sources for the mikvah. So it's very likely, why wouldn't the author tell us? So we know that that's what the normal procedure is? Yeah, he wouldn't need to tell us. Now, here's an interesting thing. If I complete a mikvah on a Samaritan, what did I just do? Well, not only that, but what did I just make them legal to do? Or what did I acknowledge them as legal to do? Yeah, eat karuma, eat the sacrificed animal. Okay, Jesus said, who's the sacrifice? No. I'm the sacrifice. And he says, we're reaping, right? We're reaping. Gonna, we're going to get to the food in John 6 soon. Yeah. Jesus being food. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a preempt. I mean, yeah, it's a, a foreshadowing. foreshadowing. John, it, well, the Greeks wouldn't call it a foreshadowing. They had no clue what that was, but we love the idea of foreshadowing. It's, I put it in my novels. You put it in all your novels. You write your novel, put a lot of foreshadowing. It's wonderful. But what we really call this is this is part of the buildup to the Logos to tell us. So the author is already preempting us with basic de, uh, definitions, right, in his argument that he's going to spring on you. The problem is you can't forget it. When we get to six, right, you got to remember all the food stuff that Jesus talked about. And we'll try to remember it all because this is a big deal. As we, It's a logos to tell us. It's not, oh, an account and, you know, the Samaritan woman and then, you know, the, the sick young ruler and this and that. No, no, no. It's all a logos to tell us driving, driving, driving to the ultimate tell us of the whole thing so that you know we unfortunately are our, our, uh, they say Gen Z now has a attention span of what five minutes or two minutes or something like that you know when I was a kid they said it was 30 minutes and, and they went to 20 you know that's why the average program is 20 minutes long right there's 10 minutes of advertising and uh, the 20 minutes of the program so they, they think that your attention span is about five, 20 minutes uh, Gen Z, they say it's about five. So that's why they make the little shows for kids, you know, at, at very short, because the kids can't pay attention for very long. Um, and by the way, we're not helping them grow their attention spans because it's really good to be able to read novels and stuff like that. So you need to have a good attention span so you can read. Anyway, um, so the end part, we have the Samaritans persuaded of the married, uh, married woman witnessing. And then it says, the Galileans received him. This is where we get the thing where it says uh, a foreteller is not honored in his own fatherland. And yet the next thing it says is the Galileans received him and he did two Simeon. We got this the second one coming up. So I condensed this, but this is the big deal here. <clears throat> Galileans received him. Okay. Now what does that mean? It means that a regal from Capernaum, which is in Galilee, right? He was obviously looking for Jesus to cure his dying son, his offspring. Jesus says this, no Simeon will ever persuade you. No Simeon will ever persuade you. He says, come down before my childling dies off. And Jesus' answer is, your offspring lives. Now, the big deal about this is a Simeon, by definition, is a ceremonial or supernatural indication. Did Jesus give him, by definition, a ceremonial or supernatural indication? Did he really? Okay, if, if, if I were going to make this happen, right, what do you do? You're a witch doctor. 